into uh, week four of the blueprint, uh, and we've been talking over and over again about the main reason we exist is to make Talmudim or to make disciples of Jesus Christ, those who are really committed to the mission. And we've said that this year needs to be a, a year of change, a year of growth at hope, uh, a change of attitude, a change of our hearts. And I have suggested now over and over, let's not just survive, let's thrive as a church, uh, as a part of the body of, of Christ. And I want to quickly remember, have us remember the key verse for uh, this whole series from Psalm 127.1, and say it with me. Unless the Lord builds the house, the builders labor in vain. Amen. Well, we've been talking uh, about the first few statements or habits or instructions, whatever that you want to call them, uh, that are part of the blueprint that God gave me back in 2018. And for those that were, have not been here uh, for a while or listening online, let's do a quick review so far. And for those who uh, have been here, I know that we always tend to forget things quickly, so uh, let's just quickly review them. So, two weeks ago, we had instruction number one, which is do not despise small beginnings. And the more I study this blueprint, the more I see that it was absolutely critical that God gave me that one first. Because we are so easily discouraged, right? Can be. But we can't. We can't worry about small uh, beginnings. It takes, uh, it takes inertia. It takes work to get it going. And then last week we talked about be led by the Spirit. Crucial. Not the flesh, but by the Spirit. And one of the first confirmations I had was the Lord is good to those whose hope is in Him to the one who seeks him. And, and he's saying, trust me, seek me in everything. But likewise, he says, you need to wait for me. Uh, it's good to wait patiently for the salvation or the deliverance of the Lord. Uh, it'd be nice, like in that testimony, to have virtually overnight uh, reports coming back. And we'll probably get some of those. But if they don't, don't worry about it. So we talked about the word wait, and it means to be intertwined with God and what he's doing. Uh, doing what you are until he calls you to the next assignment. Okay? Uh, it, it's waiting with hope. It's waiting with expectation. It's, it's waiting ready to act when God opens up the door. And, and that's the key. We don't just sit there and twiddle our, our thumbs. We talked about the word led. What does that mean? And there's two sides to it. One is from the one who's leading, who is the Holy Spirit, uh, which means to take with oneself. And so the Holy Spirit does take with us, uh, takes us, he knows where he's going, he knows what he's going to accomplish, he's there with us every step along the way, and he points the way. It's not just like, eh, go, and, and sends us off on our own. He's there with us all the way. Then the other side is to be led. And we said that the Holy Spirit is not a dictator. Uh, he invites us to willingly follow him wherever he goes. In other words, we want it or we don't. Uh, there's really, I don't think, any in between. Or if it is, you're probably sinking towards the not. But he wants us to follow him. 
We also talked last week about the third instruction, which was, we'll be facing an uphill battle. Just expect it. The first confirmation that I had was, the prophet is considered a fool and the inspired man a maniac. This was from Hosea uh, chapter 9. And we're not all prophets. I'm certainly not a prophet. I think we're all inspired by the Holy Spirit. And when we are and when we share what we're inspired to share, people can reject us. Hey, that's okay. That's, that's normal. Another confirmation I had was we'll get uh, rejection or we'll get an uphill battle from not only unbelievers, which is expected because they just don't have the same spirit in them that we do, but also from even leaders and other believers in our church. Oh, you don't want to do that. That'll never work. What do you say when somebody objects to you? Anybody remember? Starts with the letter N. Next, just move on. Don't worry about it. Uh, that's up to the Holy Spirit to do that. And then we looked at the pattern of the first three instructions. Do not despise small beginnings. Be led by the Spirit. And we'll be facing an uphill battle. And we see that... Uh, the number one points to be led by the Spirit. Number three points us back to being led by the Spirit because it's all about patience. It's all about trust. And it's God's work, and he's going to, uh, to do it. So join me uh, by taking out your, your Bibles or your Bible apps or picture in your mind your Bible if it's not here and uh, say with me the following. This is my Bible. This is my sword. Speaking to me is my awesome Lord. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you and praise you for this day. Uh, you are so, so, so good. Um, I know you're speaking to us. I know you're working on us. And I just ask that you continue to do that. I just, I, I just know there's going to be great results uh, for that. And we praise you. And we give you the glory. Yes, Lord. And all of God's people said, Amen. Now, just so you know where we're going in this series, uh, this week we're going to turn from more of an outward focus to a little bit of an inward focus. And then next week we're going to start getting serious about some internal characteristics uh, that we need to develop if we don't have them uh, to make sure that this blueprint uh, works. And then two weeks, the next two weeks, uh, Jesse Paulson's going to be sharing with us as part of his uh, ministry study, uh, doing a two-part series. Then we'll come back and do the uh, three-part uh, final sessions of the Blueprint. And then if all goes according to the way we think it's going to go, uh, Pat Johnson, you may remember him from uh, a number of months back, uh, is going to come back and lead us in uh, a study on Daniel. And then where we go from there, that's up to the Lord. So, this week we're on number four. It's not quantity, but quality that counts. Yeah, we'd love to see this place fill up. Anybody else want to see that? Yeah. But it's the, the quantity is not the importance. It's the quality that counts. So two days later, 
the Spirit spoke to me, Rod, it's not the number of faces in the seats, but how much they change. It's not just giving a good sermon. It's does that sermon change people? Has anybody ever heard of Andy Stanley? I see one, one hand here. Uh, he's a uh, couple hands, uh, three hands. He's the uh, son, I'm drawing a blank. What's his dad's name? Charles, Charles Stanley uh, from First Baptist Church down in Atlanta. And Andy wrote a book uh, called One Point Preaching. And the one point you want to focus in, in on is for change. There needs to be change. That's why we come here. I know we don't like change, but that's, that's the whole goal. And, and it's great to stand before a, a stadium full of people. That's great. That's quantity. But it's even more important in a smaller group to uh, really affect change and, and get dialogue going. About a week or so later, I had another confirmation of this from Isaiah 61, 11, uh, where it says, For the soil makes the sprout come up, and the garden causes the seeds to grow. Are, are we the soil? No. Are we the garden? No. God is. His word is. That's what makes the the sprouts come up and the seeds to grow. So the sovereign Lord makes righteousness and praise spring up before all nations. I'm going to go back to uh, the, the testimony that Bruce gave of that person that prayed for over in the Gaza Strip. Uh, he planted seeds, that person. God watered them quickly, and because of this man's righteousness, uh, praise sprang up and here we were praising him this morning so everybody remembers the story of the or the parable of the, the, the sower of the seeds don't you oh you don't okay well let's quickly uh, review the four parts of that uh, here we had a, a parable told by Jesus and he talks about a sower, a farmer who goes out and he's, he's scattering seed. And some of it falls beside the road or what we call the path. And he said the birds came and ate them up. And the sower sowed on rocky places. But the rocky places didn't have much soil. The seeds sprang up, but they were scorched. And they, because they had no root. And because they had no root, they withered away. He also sca uh, scattered seeds among the thorns. And the thorns came up and, and choked out the seeds. And he also scattered on the good soil. And the good soil yielded a crop. Some a hundredfold, some sixtyfold, some thirtyfold. Uh, Doesn't make any difference how much. There was fruit. There was a crop that grew up. Well, if you remember the story, Jesus was approached by his disciples afterwards, and they said, "What does this parable mean?" Well, let's take a quick look here. Jesus said. The seed that was sown among the path was to people who heard but didn't understand. And when you don't understand, then it's very easy for the devil to come in and, and snatch that away so they literally have nothing. And then we had the word, he said, uh, that's along the um, the rocks and he said here is where a person hears the word they receive the word yep I agree with that 
but they don't have a firm root. Uh, and then when affliction comes, when persecution comes, what do they do? They fall away. I, I've seen that all over. It's not good, but it, but it happens. And then Jesus said those were who the uh, seeds are sown into that have thorns, uh, they, they hear the word, they believe the word, but the worries of the world, the, the deceitfulness of wealth, choke the word, and they become unfruitful. Yesterday at the Multiply Conference, I had the joy of talking with one young lady who was a freshman at the University of Madison, and she wants to become a physician's assistant, not quite a doctor, but close to it, and actually do surgery uh, with that. And at the end of the session, she said, Rod, um, what word of wisdom would you give me for as, as a young person just starting school? And I thought about it for a second, and I told her this. I said, number one, love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, and all your strength. You need to put him first in every single thing that you do. And then number two, with that, wherever he tells you to go, go. Now, I know that you may have a tendency to think, well, I'm going to become rich as a doctor, and I'm going to live a good lifestyle. But that may not be what he wants. He may want to bless you that way. That's good. But maybe he wants to take you to some small, little, rural, podunk town that doesn't have a doctor. And I asked her if she'd ever seen the movie Doc Holliday. Anybody ever seen that one? Oh, it's a good one. Uh, it's about a doctor who's a, uh, uh, what do they call it when you do uh, facial surgery and, a what? Cosmetic surgery, yeah. And he was on his way to Los Angeles to become a big, famous, rich doctor doing that. But his car crashed and broke down in a little podunk town in South Carolina, someplace in the South. And that was exactly where God wanted him. He just didn't realize it. And as the story goes on, he eventually realizes that. He gives up the dream of Los Angeles, and he becomes this little small-town doctor. So I said, do that. And then I said, the third thing, leave room for God to move in your life. You can't fill up your life with so much stuff uh, that all you do is worry about it, uh, you get deceived by it, and it chokes you out, and therefore you're not fruitful. And I, I praise God afterwards. She says, oh, you've got some wisdom, don't you? So that happened to hit her uh, at that particular moment. And she was a Christian, so that was good. The last one Jesus said to his disciples is the person who hears the word, they understand the word, they cultivate themselves, they weed out what needs to be weeded out, and therefore they bear much fruit. And that is a true Talmud. And that is what we want. Now, I'm going to ask you this. Can you see how the blueprint applies to us uh, in that parable? Let's talk about that for a second here. Number one, don't despise small beginnings or failed seedlings. You're going to have some failed seedlings. You're going to plant seeds that uh, maybe won't grow, or they'll grow and they'll get choked out. They'll grow and they'll leave. Uh, don't despise those. Just keep being led by the Spirit. And don't worry about the opposition. Just keep planting 
and leading and saying, next, Lord, this is your plan. And then all together we can rejoice with Jesus. I want to take you to some farm fields in the northern part of Judah. Uh, without blowing this up even more, it's a little bit hard to see, but you see a bunch of blue lines, and they're pointing to uh, the, the borders, the walls between the different farms. And then where the red arrows are pointing, those are pointing to the fields in between those borders. And then you see all kinds of people, and they're interacting with each other, and they're going about their, their farming. And at this point, they've probably just planted... Uh, seeds. So what I want you to do is to picture using this, the world around us. Picture your family, picture your friends, picture your neighbors, picture your co-workers, and, and they've all got their own little nests. And yet they all need who? Jesus, just like we do. So here's a picture of the path next to a boundary wall. It's walked on, it's packed hard, and what it represents is that all these people in the world that don't know Jesus, they're closed in their own little worlds, their own little prisons, if you would. They think they're free, but they're really not. Uh, God has not been a part of their lives. Their hearts are hard. Now, we have to admit this is going to take a little more planting, a little bit more work, a little bit more cultivating to get through that hardness and, and, and loosen up the soil. And again, whose job is that? It's the Holy Spirit's, but he uses us to do that. The next one is a picture of rocks next to the boundary wall and this represents again people who are are weak in their faith they have little or no experience in God's goodness I was that way for many years and because of that it's easy to fall away and so again we need to be on top of it we need to be watching we need to be cultivating and planting Here's a picture of thorns that have grown up along the wall. And the focus here is on uh, people who are not being focused as a Talmud, but all the stuff and the things and the worries and the toys, and it gets them choked out. And they have the tendency to give up on God. Here's a picture of kind of all all of them together. You see the weeds and the rocks and the thorns uh, on either side of that wall. You see the path where the farmer walks, but you also see the good soil, and you've got a, a tree that sprang up, an olive tree or fruit tree, whatever it is. You see the hay. That ground is bringing forth a good crop. So we need to be like this soil right here. We need to work at cultivating in others this type of soil where they overcome, they're cultivated, they grow and bear much fruit. So the whole point of this is like the farmer, we sow as directed. Again, being led by who? The Spirit. It's good to sow everywhere, but I believe it's even more important to sow where he specifically directs us. Now, we can't use that as an excuse. Well, God, I haven't heard from you yet. Uh, who do I talk to today? No excuse. Maybe you're just not listening, so listen up. And why is this important? Uh, because Jesus said, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws them. God knows who is going to respond. 
He knew from before the beginning of time. So it's not just about a harvest, it's also about planting seeds. And it's not just about planting seeds, it's about cultivating and getting a good harvest. The fifth instruction I received that first night was, from few will come many for his glory. From few will come many. Bruce and I were talking yesterday at the Multiply Conference about uh, the, the principle of multiplication. Uh, I find somebody, you find somebody, uh, we grow them, they each go out and find somebody, and pretty soon you've got a, a very large, significant number, and that's good. But God also told me two days later, Rod, you may not see them all. You may not see the multiplication, but that's okay. He said, I provide the soil, I provide the seed, I provide the rain. As my ambassador, all you need to do is just keep sowing the seed. And the rest will fall into place. I think back, oh, 40 some years ago now, when I first became a Christian, there was a, a couple of older gals up in their 80s, Ruth and Edna, they became our family mentor. She gave me, gave me my first opportunity to preach, not having any clue what would turn out in the future. But she just simply did what she was instructed to do. She mentored, she cultivated, she gave me an opportunity. And many good fruits have come out of that ever since. And I think of a lot of the people that I've mentored and cultivated, and I have no idea what's happened since. And, and I don't really get concerned about it because that's not my job, it's his job. So we just need to keep going out and doing what we need to do. That same day I got a, oh, am I behind on the scenes here? got another confirmation. The God who supplies seed to the sower will increase your store of seed. Not might, not maybe, he will. Yes and amen. That's a promise of his. He'll enlarge the harvest of our righteousness. Now what does that mean? That means we need to go out and be righteous. We need to go out and be obedient. And when we are, he will increase our store of seeds so we can sow even more. Then that same day, I got one last confirmation about from few will come many for his glory. And it was this, Rod, keep praying. And so I say to you, hope, keep praying. Praying that the heavens above would rain down righteousness. Pray that the earth would open wide. Pray that salvation would spring up. Pray that righteousness would grow with it. And why? Because I, the Lord, have created it. That's what he said. And then about a week and a half later, <clears throat> just in case I forgot, I got this one. From Isaiah 37, 28. Have you not heard? Long ago I ordained it. In the days of old I planned it. Now I have brought it to pass. This is what we need to keep in mind. Before the beginning of time, God had this plan all laid out. He knew where each of us would be, where each of us would come into the kingdom and the assignments he had for each of us. And he's bringing it to pass. As a matter of fact, he's already brought it to pass. It now just has to happen over time. 
So, I'm going to ask this. What pattern do you see when you see these two instructions? It's not quantity, but quality that counts. From few will come many for his glory. What pattern do you see? Here's the pattern that I see. If we do our part, the key word there is what? If. If we faithfully sow a seed, if we faithfully trust God for the results, if we faithfully disciple, and that means we may need to change a lot of diapers. I don't like changing diapers, but God puts us in that position with non-believers as well as believers. So follow-up is just as important as planting. If we do our part, then God will do his part. He will draw people in. He will supply the seed and the growth. He's in control. That's his promise. So let's stand on it. Yesterday at the Multiply Conference, I truly believe that God spoke to uh, everybody in a different way. Uh, the way he spoke to me was through some of the stories that people uh, talked about, uh, both up on the screen, on the stage, and, and in our small groups. And a, and a pattern, oh, a blueprint, oh, love that word, uh, came out to me. And here's the pattern. Initial seed planting is number one. Sharing the gospel is number two. And then growing a new disciple is number three. And the most critical one uh, is, to me, the initial seed planting. And the stories that came out, oh, I didn't want to hear that. I really didn't want to. One of the guys said, uh, what was it, Jackson, 19 years it took before he had an opportunity to share the gospel. He met with this man on a regular basis. 19 years. Do not despise what? <laughs> Small beginnings. And then the man opened up and he says, share with me, I see your faith. I see what you're made of. I see your character. And the opportunity to share the gospel was, uh, was presented. It was used. And that person became a new disciple and growing, uh, hopefully, to this day. Now, there's many ways to go out and plant seeds. I remember back to the days of Billy Graham. Anybody remember Billy Graham? Well, a few hands. Wow, what a preacher. I love that man. Uh, he was used by God to speak to thousands and hundreds of thousands. Uh, this is a picture of Billy Graham in, in, I think, South Korea. Look at the size of that crowd. But you know, the more I thought about it, the more I thought back to the year that Billy Graham came to uh, Minneapolis and, and had a, a rally here. And I had the honor of being one of the trained counselors to meet with people when the altar call was given and to uh, come down and, and receive Christ. And one of the nights, I invited a friend of mine, a client, a co-worker. And I believe now that I think about it, the reason that she and her husband came was because of the relationship that we already had. They had seen me in action. They knew where I was coming from. And then the Holy Spirit spoke, and, and they came. And when Billy Graham gave the invitation, guess where they went? 
down to the main floor and I went with them and they gave their hearts to the Lord afterwards we started a Bible study for her whole family right in my office oh, it was wonderful they'd been life go lifelong Catholics all their life never opened up the Bible I gave them each a Bible and we just started from the beginning Old Testament, New Testament and how to find verses and, and, and so forth and we just built from there he went on to become a teacher at his work he started Bible studies down there you talk about the multiplication process and I had no idea what was going to turn out there I have no idea what those people are, are doing now or, or have done but again that's not my, my problem so Big gatherings like this, I think, are good. I don't think they're very common today. Certainly not in America. I know Billy's son, Franklin. I don't think he does them, does he? Anybody know? He's on TV a lot, or the radio a lot, and, and doing it that way. Another way, another method, and again, none of them is right or wrong, is to have a, a classroom setting. Uh, I think of the Alpha program. People come to a, get invited and they come to an Alpha program and I don't know how many weeks it is but uh, they get a basic study uh, in the Bible and faith and get an opportunity to receive Jesus. And that's good and I know Alpha is still going on. But again I would surmise that the vast majority of people that come to Alpha had had some kind of a relationship with somebody before and now they get an opportunity to learn and they respond to it. On the lower right hand side uh, I had an opportunity, this isn't it here but it's a picture that represents it, to uh, put up a notice in our condo building about a class that I had put together called Bible Basics 101. It was like 10 weeks. Introduction to the Bible. Uh, what are eight words that describe the Bible story? And son of a gun, we had four or five that turned out for it and stuck with us for the whole time. But it was certainly much more personal. But what I heard yesterday is the best way the best way to plant seeds is one-on-one. -on -one. Guys, stick to guys. Women, stick to women. Don't try and cross-pollinate, because that cannot turn out good. Let the Lord lead you to one person that you can get to know preferably an unbeliever get to know them let them get to know you don't pounce on them uh, don't jump all over them with the gospel unless they open up to it and just let the Lord's Holy Spirit lead now in that regard several months ago I introduced to you uh, a word called the intentional ones. Anybody remember that? Uh, one person remembers that. And after yesterday's session, I was prompted to introduce that this week. What is an intentional one? An intentional one is a Talmud who intentionally goes out to find one person that they can plant seeds in. Cultivate that relationship. Grow that relationship. Pray for that person. Meet with them on a regular basis. Yeah, it's going to take some time. It's going to take some effort. But that's what we need to do. Be an intentional one. Again, intentional and just start with one. You don't have to go for five or ten or twenty. Pick one. Can, can you all pick one person or let the Lord pick one? 
As a matter of fact, I would say, what happened here? Uh, pray this prayer. Lord, connect me with one. Can you say that with me? Lord, connect me with one. Now, if you really, really mean that, and you really, really pray it, I know God will honor that, and he'll bring you one person. It may be a family member. It may be a neighbor. It may be a friend. It may be a coworker. doesn't make any difference. It could be a total stranger. But he wants to connect each and every one of us with one. So, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 12, 30, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40. We've got 18 of us in here this morning. If we all connected with one, developed a relationship, and those all became fruitful, we'd have twice the number. Oh, we've got a couple more in the back. 20. That's the goal. That's what I want to challenge you with is, Lord, connect me with one. And not just connect yourself with one, but the, part, the purpose of the intentional ones is to surround yourself with like-minded people. We have this tendency to become lone wolves, don't we? We do. But if we connect up with each other, if you tell me, yes, I want to be an intentional one, now you and I can work together. I can encourage you. You can encourage me. And, and, and maybe another person says it, another person. Pretty soon we've got a, a small group. And we can get together and we can share with each other what works, what doesn't work. We can share uh, how to share the gospel, what makes up the gospel. How can we do it? We can practice. Practice makes perfect. But if you're a lone wolf, you don't have that advantage. So again, I'm asking you, find one. Now when you find the one, and you've started building that relationship, maybe God will lead you to a second, or a third, or a fourth. That's okay. Just follow his leading. So the discussion question today, and then we'll wrap this up, Will you become an intentional one? Will you become an intentional one? And if you're not sure right now, what, what's holding you back? Talk with somebody about that. We had one gal yesterday uh, in the first session who admitted that she was full of fear when it comes to reaching out. She wanted to reach out, but she just had fear. How, how do I overcome that? And so I gave her a, a, a beautiful way to do that. And we got done with that, and she goes, wow, that's easy. So if you'd like to know what that is, come up and talk to me afterwards. And I'll share that with you. And it's, and it's fun and it's, and it's humorous. So we are all invited to become an intentional one. Uh, again, it's not a group thing. It's not a, or I'm sorry, it's, it's not a program. It, it's, it's working together for the good news of the kingdom. And again, out back, we've got those cards about the four critical life questions. Easy way to say hi to somebody and, and see if a spiritual conversation will start. So you're invited to come up after the, the last song, which Jackson's going to come up for now. And and team uh, and just pray with me share with me that yeah you'd like to become an intentional one maybe it's going to take a little bit of work maybe you got to think on it 
but at least express an interest so I know that some change is happening here at Hope. Amen? Let's pray. Father, we thank you. We praise you. We give you the, the, the glory for everything. And Lord, I know you have many, many ways to, uh, to reach people. Uh, we all have our favorites. Some are very good at building relationships. Some are not. But shape us, mold us, weed us, grow us, motivate us, not for our glory, but for your glory. May we make Talmudim disciples of Jesus Christ. May we be strong, fruitful Talmudim. Let this church thrive, not just survive. And all of God's people said, Amen.